get started. So uh, thanks for coming. This is the uh, session five for bioengineering, and our first speaker is going to be Alexa Melvin from QL, talking about modeling of 3D printed check valves and microfluidic systems. such as gas flow control, integrated into different micro pumps, and then also connections with chemical analysis systems. So currently, most check valves are created using soft lithography um, via replica molding. And so with replica molding, you have this master mold, and then PDMS is poured onto the mold, and it's set into an oven to cure. Uh, then it's peeled off of the mold, and then undergoes an adhesion process, and typically <coughs> this is um, plasma oxidation bonding. Um, so this is very popular among researchers because it's inexpensive, biocompatible, and it translucent. So they're able to see the um, fluid as it moves through the channel. However, this is difficult to scale up and commercialize just because the master mold creation is labor intensive. Uh, so recently, 3D printing has become of interest uh, for microfluidics. Uh, most commonly, people have been investigating stereolithography, or SLA, uh, because it has the ability to make quasi-arbitrary 3D printed shapes, which is not always possible, and it's very difficult to do with uh, PDMS and soft lithography. Um, so this uses a photo photopolymerization, um, so you have a photo resin in a bath, and then a beam of light focuses it and cures it into the <coughs> shape, and then the uncured uh, resin is washed out of the channels. Um, so this is very uh, attractive for microfluidics because you can get small geometric features that aren't um, possible with uh, traditional 3D printing techniques. Um, so the other common 3D printing application is fused deposition modeling, or FDM. Now this is most popular in research just because it is cheaper and more accessible to researchers. Um, and it uses thermoplastic materials that it uh, takes a filament and heats it to a specific point and then it deposits it the material layer by layer. Um, however, most research has been focused on using SLA um, and to the best of our knowledge, no research has been done to investigate the use of FDM to create micro uh, valves. So this study was performed to analyze the range of valve thicknesses necessary to promote forward flow using commonly available 3D printed filaments, materials using the fluid structure interaction module, and console multi-physics. So fluid structure interaction can be defined as a coupling of fluid dynamics with solid <coughs> mechanics. And so we use an arbitrary Lagrangian Julian or ALE formulation, and so this allows the mesh to be modeled as a solid mesh to track the movement of the fluid. Um, so we used a monolithic approach, meaning that both the structural mechanics and the fluid dynamics were solved at the same time to give a more accurate representation. Um, so this is just an outline of the governing equation. So first we set up the fluid flow using Navier-Stokes, and solid deformation using a linear elastic model. And so those were coupled together and applied with a moving mesh. And then we applied our boundary conditions, so both fluid forces and then the fluid velocities onto the structures. And then lastly, it was solved and this iterated until a solution converged. Uh, so our model set up. So we did a very simple uh, microfluidic structure just to uh, 
figure out how the fluid structure interaction works. Um, so we have our inlet and outlet. <coughs> uh, we have our actuated valve, which is in green, and then our valve stop, um, which is just a restriction. So if there is backflow, the valve will hit it and fluid will uh, re-enter the previous channel. Uh, so we tested six different materials, <coughs> ABS, PLA, nylon, pet feed, and PDMS, which was used as our baseline since that's commonly used for microfluidics. Um, so we, since it was a short channel, we only did 100 micron uh, length. We uh, created the velocity, the inlet velocity, as a fully formed flow um, to get an accurate representation of how the valve would deflect. Um, and then to, in order to have the boundary connect, so the actuated valve to the valve stop, we used a viscous wall approach. Um, and so that just means the valve stop was modeled as the PDMS or uh, really viscous fluid so the two um, valve and the valve stop could connect. Um, so we used a time dependent study and analyzed the valve deformation from 0 to 0 0.75 seconds um, and this was the point where all materials reached the steady state opening phase. Um, so up top you see when the valve's completely open, or when the valve's closed, there's no flow moving. Um, and then at 0 0.7 seconds, the valve actually deflected about six microns in this image. Um, and then the picture here on the right is just showing the boundary contact. So there's no fluid flow, but there's a lot of stress when the uh, valve actually hits that valve stop. Mm -hmm. um, so looking at the different materials, um, so the TPU followed that same similar deformation pattern as PDMS. Um, it would just required uh, not as thick valves. Um, and then looking at the other common materials like PLA and ABS, they, due to their high Young's modulus, they exhibited much lower valve deformations. Um, and so it's actually kind of hard to see, but ABS is right under the orange curve, which is the PET-G. And then the nylon and PLA follow that same um, deformation pattern. And so we were only able to achieve about a four micron uh, valve deflection. And by a thickness of 12 microns, there was no um, valve deflection at all. So no flow could uh, be pushed through the channel. Um, so since the TPU followed that same deformation pattern as PDMS, we went ahead and did a 3D simulation because in the 2D simulation, you have the infinite volume of fluid, and so we wanted to contain the fluid and get a more realistic um, model of how the valve would work in the system. And so with the 3D uh, simulations, we found that the deformation was actually slightly increased, and so we were able to achieve uh, higher valve thicknesses while still promoting that forward flow. <coughs> Uh, so in conclusion, materials with a significantly low Young's modulus permit the adequate flow um, actuation of a valve at 70 micron per second inlet velocity. Um, the TPU exhibited similar deformation when it was compared directly to our PDMS baseline. Um, and this demonstrated the use of potential FDM filaments for microvalves. However, this is dependent on the current resolution of FDM printers. So most printers can only go down to about 100 microns. Um, but they are currently uh, working on developing higher resolution printers. Uh, we have one in our lab that can reliably go down to 50 microns, and they're claiming that with the new firmware update, we could potentially go down to 20. Uh, so future work is optimizing the check valve geometry to realize both 3D printed features. So we've actually started working on this in our lab and we've been able to print a couple models and start testing them as well. Um, we'll also evaluate minimum flow rates required to open check valves for a variety of designs, and this includes interdigitated arrays and tapered structures, but then also investigating something like a biomimetric leaflet valve, kind of like a heart valve. Uh, so I want to thank my mentor, Dr. Thomas Roussel, for his guidance with this and his expertise for console. <laughs> Uh, are there any questions? <coughs> yes. So have you considered uh, other valves? Because, you know, check valves, you know, you have to worry about deflection and all that stuff. 
but think if you think back, you know, uh, a ball and cage valve or something like that, it doesn't need any deflection of any structures. It's purely based on solid structures and based on the flow that ball can move in a ball and cage valve. So have you considered 3D printing some of those? I understand the resolution is not there, but that way you don't have to worry about deflection and all of that stuff, and you can 3D print it in any direction that you want as long as you can 3D print a ball or put a ball in there and 3D print a cage. Uh, we hadn't really considered that. Part of the reason was these valves would eventually be incorporated into like a piezoelectric uh, micro pump. So it goes into our larger system of our sample preparation module. Will it will allow us to use like squeeze the manifold to allow the fluid to go instead of using a syringe pump to promote the flow. But a ball, uh, ball and cage valve, it still has very low. I mean, it, it was used as heart valves, and so. The pressure difference that you need to actually move the ball in a ball and cage valve is not that much. Uh, my only comment would be <coughs> to release the ball, right? So you can actually um, reprint things mm -hmm. uh, interiorly with very, um, uh, very small cross-sectional area connections. Mm -hmm. You can figure out how to release that little piece in the middle of the channel. So I think it's something that, that we can. She's actually made a few of these valves on the 100 micron scale or something. That's even worth it. Well. So of course we're limited by the resolution. Yeah. So you, I assume we're modeling water or some basic solution. Does the viscosity have an effect here? So if you're using a highly viscous <coughs> fluid, would you have a different um, effect? Uh, I think I <coughs> did a couple simulations with uh, viscous related to blood, um, but we mainly did it related to water just because initially it's going to be used on diluted plasma, um, but I think it did affect the deflection. I think there wasn't quite as much, um, but that's definitely something we need to investigate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, so I guess some of the materials you were pointing out, uh, those were FDM materials, right? Or? Yes. Okay. So not, not SLA? Yes. And I, I think one of the concerns with SLA is it's not biosafe anyway. So yeah, it kind of <coughs> crumbly from what we've. You know, the smaller the revolution, the more kind of yeah. or, you know powdery it gets. It kind of disintegrates when it's really thin. Um, is there so you modeled 100 micron channels, but um, if the channels are much larger or smaller, would that affect? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, smaller, you wouldn't necessarily have to have much, uh, as a high flow rate just because there's going to be more pressure exerting on the valve. Um, and like Dr. Roussel said, that we were starting to test um, with 100 micron a valve. So our channels are bigger, um, and so we're able to do a higher flow rate and still get that deflection. So it kind of a trade off between your resolution and Okay, so our next speaker I'll introduce, so he doesn't have to introduce himself, is uh, Dr. Roussel from U of L, and he's going to talk about development of proportional valves for support training system growth force. Uh, so good afternoon. This uh, this uh, should be actually. <coughs> being given by Eli Ackerman, who was a master student who just graduated, but he took a job uh, with Medtronic in Miami. So what we want to talk about is this uh, this uh, respiratory system called breath, breath force. We're working with Fraser Rehab, and uh, uh, you know, Dr. Harkma talked about the uh, spinal cord injury uh, research that she's doing, and so I, we're actually working also with some of the other researchers in that area. And, uh, and one of the researchers is uh, as Alex, Alex Ovechkin, who's an MD, PhD, and he, he kind of really focuses on the respiratory side of things. Uh, so if we talk statistics a little bit, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Harkema probably talked a little bit about the statistics of, uh, of spinal cord injury and, you know, vehicular accidents are pretty much the number one cause. And uh, we know all of the bad things that happen. Uh, severe SEIs that occur in the cervical region have, have two real deleterious effects on physiology. Uh, and it really has to do with breathing and some, to some extent because of that cardiovascular. 
And uh, if you look at the statistics, respiratory complications are really the number one cause of morbid morbidity and mor mortality in these spinal cord injury patients. Uh, so what Dr. Ovechkin and some of the researchers uh, down at, at Fraser are doing is using uh, respiratory mus muscle therapy, so breathing regimens, uh, as a way to do rehabilitation for these patients. Uh, so you can think of it just as like lifting weights, except you're doing it specifically for breathing patterns. Uh, mm -hmm. There are devices on the market that do uh, this respiratory muscular therapy. Most of them are not marketed uh, for rehabilitation. They're mostly marketed for sports enthusiasts. They want to increase their respiratory capacity. Uh, the issue that, uh, that they have in using these in the clinical environment is the fact that uh, they're typically pretty expensive and they don't translate, therefore, to clinical rehabilitation. They're kind of cumbersome for spinal cord injury patients to use. And most of them are focused only on respiration, that is the exhale portion of respiration. So there's no inhalation capability for training. So you're basically breathing as hard out as you can. Uh, so the most common uh, one of these is made in Europe. Uh, and these run about $500, I guess, something like that, four or $500. Uh, so what uh, we were tasked to do uh, by another master's student was to develop this portable system to provide this therapy that they've developed. So they have a whole um, a series of steps that they do to do this therapy for the patients in the clinic. They wanted to, they, they thought that there was a good chance that this type of therapy could be translated to the home environment. So instead of the patients having to come into the clinic to get the therapy, they ought to be able to do it every day in their house. Uh, so um, myself and Kevin Tran, who got his master's last year, came up with this breath force system. Uh, this is the, the control box. This is the user interface. So basically, it, it follows the protocol that's been designed down at Fraser uh, to measure the maximum and minimum inhalation pressure. And then they do training at about 20% of that. So that's the maximum pressure that, that they uh, train at. Uh, the display is kind of a touchscreen interface. This is battery powered so they can bring it home. Um, the system actually has manually set valves. So, so these are uh, commercial off the shelf uh, respiratory training valves. There's one for exhalation, there's one for inhalation. And they're basically just check valves and that you pre-stress these check valves with these manual adjustment valves. The spring, the spring pushes back as you turn the valve. Uh, there's kind of a crude adjustment for centimeters of water on there. Uh, so what we uh, combined our pressure measurement with this manually adjusted valve and they do this therapy, the, uh, the system actually uh, follows them, they follow along with the therapy, it guides them, gives them feedback, it saves the data and so the next time they go to the clinic the clinicians can actually look at the data and make sure they're, they're uh, doing their studies, they're supposed to do it once a day, make sure they do it once a day and then they can kind of track the progress. Uh, the problem with this is these valves are really, really poorly designed. They work well, but these, uh, when we measure the pressure, the, crack, the cracking pressure of these valves is nowhere near what the, uh, the uh, gradations on these uh, manually set valves. So uh, as, a, as a way to uh, give a really good, simple project to one of my master's students, we wanted to somehow de uh, design and develop a very inexpensive proportional control valve. These are commercially available, but they're typically for very high pressure. And, and they're very expensive, so $250 is, is, a, is pretty much the smallest you can get. They're very uh, low cross-sectional area, so they already have some kind of resistance. So we had a couple objectives to do here. I wanted to teach him some basic uh, engineering design, so 3D printing, electronics, programming. So we wanted to motorize an off-the-shelf ball valve, very low cost, right? These valves are 2 or $3 and develop some software to adjust the valves and steps of, of just a single degree so we could have the system set that resistance. And then have an enclosure to seat the valves together um, into kind of a, a self-contained system. So uh, he dove uh, head first into it. We used a, a simple servo mechanism. You know, these servos are about $20. Uh, and we bought this uh, half-inch uh, cross-sectional area ball valve, uh, combined them in a 3D printed enclosure, and got to work at trying to design just a couple of uh, gears that would um, make everything fit well together. And of course, he did lots of iterations. The uh, valve valve, we just took the manual control off of it and uh, kind of reverse engineered the gear to be able to fit on that thing. So he worked through some uh, issues with gear alignment, the attachment to the valve valve, and we actually finally got, uh, um, I don't know if we can, 
got a little video of this kind of working. So this is just kind of a crude uh, way of doing this. It's like a $30 solution to the problem. Uh, so we had a microcontroller. Oh, that microcontroller set the um, set the position of the gear. Of course, we started with uh, just potentiometer control and then push buttons so we could go degree by degree, and eventually we let the microcontroller set the position just numerically. Uh, final gear ratio was about 3.2. This actually worked pretty well. We were kind of surprised because that ball valve is designed for 100 psi, and it's really, really hard to turn manually. Uh, there really are no low pressure uh, ball valves. It's really surprising that none of those exist. Uh, so we developed some software. We had to come up with a bench top uh, mechanism to actually test the, the, uh, the valve working. So this is kind of a, a crude setup, so it vents to the atmosphere here. We've got a pressure sensor right close to the inlet. And then we just have a, an air compressor that, that we can close the valve, set the, the pressure, uh, the static pressure starting with uh, for some range. Now these are higher than, than physiological um, you know, PSI. One PSI is pretty good. If you can blow one PSI, that's great. Um, but we did uh, uh, wind up with about a single degree valve position steps. Now we could have gone to a much bigger gear to get that smaller, but we wanted to kind of keep it uh, uh, relatively small. And a couple of different uh, mechanisms for once we reached uh, constant flow, how long do we wait for the uh, valve position has changed. We did some benchtop tests and we also had a, 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 just a, a human test subject just to kind of do some regular breathing cadence <coughs> just to see if we can capture that data. And so we can see that uh, for, we're looking at data here that is uh, uh, constant uh, initial flow and then we step the valves in, in single degree in increments and you can see that uh, it does take four or five degrees before we actually start seeing a pressure drop. And if you have a low uh, initial pressure, the flow rate's kind of small. So I'm not sure that the pressure sensor that we're using, which is a physiological range pressure sensor, is kind of adequate. I don't, I, I, well, it's kind of large um, compared to physiological pressure sensor ranges. We might need to uh, get one that's a little bit more sensitive. But we do see the patterns generally that we uh, see. So some of the steps were 10 second inter uh, intervals, increments between uh, changing the valve position and then sometimes longer. But we do see a little transition issue, so the valves don't always open by single degree. And that just has to do with the uh, kind of, it's not the best uh, gearing uh, connection. Uh, there's some issues with that still that we need to solve. Uh, and then we, if we look at the data for uh, some volunteer, we've got a lot more data on this now. And the colors aren't showing up here, but the large peaks are uh, when the valves um, closed. So it's, it's about 10 degrees. Uh, I guess 10 degrees open from fully closed and then 30% open so you can see the max pressure for that cadence changes with the ratio and that's really what we wanted to see is whether or not we could actually open the valve in a small enough increment to get that resistance so that's what we were really happy about so still have a little uh, motor jitter uh, it's hard to perfectly position those uh, gears to where you don't get that, uh, that jitter the ball valve obviously is made for high pressure so it resists turning so we need a better solution I'll talk about that in a second and obviously we need, we, need some, we need more data, right? Uh, so we have a few solutions on how to uh, do these things. Use a larger power supply, a larger uh, um, servo motor. But what we've done is we've actually moved on from that ball valve and we've designed our own little butterfly valve. So this is 3D printed. Uh, I have the, the version here if anybody wants to look at it. So we use a spray gasket material and we're starting to integrate that into our system so we don't have to use that uh, very high resistance uh, uh, valve. So. Uh, some of the future work is we want to uh, eventually develop this feedback algorithm so the system software based on the maximum pr uh, exhalation inhalation pressure and the training uh, pressure we can have the system automatically change the valve position to maintain that resistance so no matter how, how hard you blow you'll never go above that uh, training resistance value so that's kind of where we're headed we actually have a few companies that are interested in licensing the technology that's a recent development so we're pretty uh, excited about that um, so these are everybody that's worked on it. Uh, Kevin actually got his master's and went to work for Dr. Ovechkin downtown at Fraser, so I'm pretty happy about that. Yeah. All right, any questions? That's so very, uh, really neat work. Um, one thing I'm curious, a little bit of maybe devil's advocate here. So uh, first of all, are these 
Is this covered at all by the insurance or anything? Or are they basically paying out of pocket as um, patients? So right now, and actually last week I had a conversation with Chen downtown. He wants me to make about 30 of these for all their patients. Uh, so that's a good question. I mean, we're trying to, to build something that we probably could have made for $50 or $100. You know, the point right now is just to get the patients to be able to bring something home. So the clinic wants to have these, a cache of these things. And when they come in and have a new patient, where you're going to do the therapy here, but when you go home, take this and do the therapy every day. So at, at this point, um, we don't have plans to commercialize, but we do have uh, a feeling that some of these uh, companies that have the, the you know, the, the systems already there could incorporate. Right. If we could develop this algorithm, yeah. then it would be a really, that, and all the companies we've talked to so far, they're all trying it. They're all trying to come up with this algorithm that, that can relate that, that pressure and have the valve adjust as they breathe. So they That would be great. But I, you know, you mentioned the, the actuator system is $250. I, I think for medical equipment. That's, that's probably not, not much, yeah, right? but if you wanted to sell it to, you know, if they cost a whole lot, you wouldn't Unless want to give them to your pocket. patients. It could be. Yeah. If could patients be, are paying out of pocket, that's a whole different thing. It, it, could, it could be. I don't know. It could yeah. be. And there might be one, a commercial version that has a large enough uh, original diameter, right? Because the ones that we found were all quarter inch, which, you know, if, if that's fully open, it creates a resistance already. So we wanted to target with normal respiratory spirometer type, which is half half inch or greater. So there, when you breathe through that, there's very little resistance. So that's why you need to have that custom. The, right. The, yeah. So there's that no button that we yeah. couldn't find any mini ball right. valves yeah. that were for low pressures right. that weren't small, right, small orifice. Yeah. So, you know, butterfly valves are going to be better for you simply because it's hardly any resistance. Um, and what FDA pathway will you be going through? Because you still have to get FDA approval since it's a quote unquote medical device. Yeah, well, we're hoping that uh, since there are predicate devices right now, um, so it would be an easy 510K avenue um, simply because we're adding the feature of being able to do inhalation as well. So what, what's not shown is there are filters on the system. So there's, you know, you have a front end that's this disposable $2 um, mouthpiece that you can throw away on, on both ends actually. So there's no humidity that gets into the system. And it's so right now, um, you said there's a manual adjustment for the resistance. Is that how how that's is this the, determined? Yeah, you know, how do they decide which resistance to use? Is there a so in the in the original system, uh, the first step that they do is they record their max and min pressure. So they they close the valve completely. I think they open it one one degree, blow as hard as they can, and then they set the resistance at twenty percent of that pressure. And so the, the the manual adjustment valves actually are graded in centimeters of water. So they set that dial to 20% of whatever their maximum is. And that's where they train at. Yeah. So ideally, you'd be able to automate that. Correct. You measure, you measure the max, and then the valve up. is always going to open to where when you're blowing, it ne you never exceed that pressure. Right? right. So if you blow hard, it's going to open the valve until you're breathing right at that set pressure. And the, and the valve is automatic, always being adjusted. All right, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, you have a oh, sorry. Are any yeah. longer term yes. hard? The yes. patients evaluated to see if it's actually helping. Uh, so, uh, what the software does is it saves that maximum and minimum exhalation pressure. So that's kind of the trend they want to see because they're going to do that once a week or twice a month, and they track that maximum pressure. So as they recover, that that, I, and I'm showing you that data, but the trend is dramatic of of how hard they can so blow and how deep they can inhale over time as they do the therapy. So your collaborators are collecting this data? Correct. That would, Correct. That's, that's very valuable. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. But if you can maintain that stable resistance, probably that data will be more consistent. <coughs> yeah, that's what we accurate. hope. Yeah, we hope that, that uh, you know, we, we want them, to, when they're training at 20%, they, we want them to see 20% and not breathe too rapidly and, and experience a higher pressure, right? That's what they'll see if they don't breathe at a regular cadence. They'll see a higher pressure if the valve's at a particular position. But the system ought to be able to relieve that pressure just enough to where they don't exceed that target training. So why do you think no one has come up with this before? A simple system that's cheaper? I, 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 really, I really don't know. Uh, we've talked with a couple of the companies that sell the products now, and um, they really don't market it for, for respiratory therapy for, for uh, spinal cord injury patients. It's really for, for athletes. 
and they only they only target uh, exhalation, no inhalation, which is the dive training the dive. So I think that's why they're interested is because they didn't they haven't thought about the medical side of it. And there are clinical systems that are hundreds of thousands, well tens of thousands of dollars that do some similar, but it's still all manually set valve. Very interesting. to segment cerebral vasculature. And this is Heba Kendall. Put it in the back. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to present my paper entitled Using 3D's Convolutional Neural Networks and Local Blood Flow Information to Segment uh, Cerebral Vasculature. The research motivation about, uh, behind this uh, paper is uh, the severe disease hypertension. Hypertension is uh, affects one in three adults in the U.S. and is uh, a leading cause of mortality. And it's known that chronically elevated cerebral perfusion pressure (CBP) alters the structure of cerebral blood vessels, and this alteration or change uh, has a is a major contributor to some severe diseases such as dementia, Alzheimer's, cognitive impairments, and uh, a lesion uh, of the brain. So. Recent studies suggest that this structure genes of cerebral vascular uh, of the blood vessels um, precede the elevation of systemic blood pressure. So if we can develop a computer-aided diagnosis system to measure and quantify these cerebral changes before its onset, we can help clinicians to predict hypertension or pre-hypertension and enhance can optimize medical plans to, uh, to mitigate any adverse events. Uh, so. This is the research motivation behind uh, our project. And the first step in such a system is the segmentation of cerebral blood vessel. And this is our objective, to build a novel cerebral blood vessel segmentation framework that is able to delineate the vascular tree of human brains from magnetic resonance and geography automatically and efficiently. Uh, we are going to say a brief introduction about segmentation. Segmentation is a crucial step in almost every medical analysis system. Uh, however, there are some factors that affect the segmentation accuracy, including the uh, scanning uh, parameters, the application domain, the imaging modality. Specifically, the cerebral vasculature of the brain has its own challenge. In terms of the complex geometry of the vascular tree, the wide range or dynamic range of intensity, the density and the small size of the, uh, the, the diameters of the blood vessels, also the high intervariability of uh, brains that uh, may hinder the creation of common atlas to be used to segment uh, such a vasculature. In addition, the variability of the, the, the strength of the blood flow signal throughout the uh, MRI scans of patients uh, is different, either by increase and decrease. And this introduces, over time of course, and this introduces more in uh, homogeneities uh, in the slices of the MRA and, and make the segmentation accuracy um, as a challenging problem. This uh, results in a lack of segmentation algorithms that targets the delineation of the cerebral vasculature. So, we propose a framework that is able to delineate the vascular, uh, uh, the vasculature of the brain of the human being using a 3D convolutional neural networks and taking into consideration the information of uh, the variability of blood flow uh, strength over the range of uh, MRA slices. 
The first part of our methodology is the input data. We used uh, 30 volumes of uh, clinical magnetic resonance angiography, which were collected and approved by an RI, uh, an RI, uh, RP protocol uh, with, uh, collaborating with Pittsburgh University. And it reflects a range of patients from different uh, ages and uh, who has some uh, pathological blood vessels uh, in addition to the normal blood vessels. And we uh, have uh, uh, divided our data into 20 volumes we use for training and 10 volumes <coughs> for testing. And each volume of our data consists of about 160 slices of this spread size. The second part in our framework is bias correction. This is the only pre-processing step that we use in this uh, framework because, uh, as you might know, that C in the end does not impose any pre-processing uh, on the data. So uh, we did uh, some bias field correction uh, on the MRA data we used to reduce the uh, intensity in homogeneities that may be uh, result from some magnetic settings. It um, depends also the bias effects and removes any inconsistencies by smoothing the MRD da data um, by accounting for the 3D specially uh, homogeneous pairwise interaction between the gray level of an MRA scan. Uh, the, th the third step in our uh, framework is the data partitioning. And uh, why we did the data partitioning and not just uh, uh, apply the, uh, the framework on the whole uh, MRA scan of the of the brain, because as we said, we want to take account um, uh, of the variability of uh, the blood flu signal trends throughout the slices of an MRA scan. And to do so, we have partitioned each uh, MRA uh, volume into two compartments uh, relative uh, to some markers, which is a circle of wellness, such that, that each compartment um, would potentially contain the blood vessels of similar appearance and primeness. So we have divided our data into two parts as I've said. One is above circle of wellness and one starts at circle of wellness and continue until below. The third part in our um, framework is uh, uh, feeding the data, the, the partition data to the CNN. Uh, we use a deep 3D CNN which is composed of 11 layers to provide more discriminative power. Um, and a receptive field of 17 by 3. And each feature extraction layer it has 3 by 3 kernels. And the classification layer is convolutional with 1 by uh, 3 kernels. The uh, proposed approach takes uh, adjacent image patches and densely between them into one pass of the network. Uh, also, it processes the input image at multi scale to incorporate um, much local and contextual information as possible to enhance and render the segmentation process. And uh, generally, this uh, approach works in two components. The first component that takes the uh, MRA data and produce a highly accurate segmentation or soft segmentation maps, which in turn uh, be fitted to the second component, which is a 3D fully connected uh, condition random field that uh, works on this data and uh, removes any false positives and produce the final hard plates. Um, our experimental results here, we have gold standard ground truth for the 30 volumes of data, which were, were designated manually by a medical imaging expert. And we have used efficacy evaluation matrix in terms of diet similarity coefficient and sensitivity and specificity. <coughs> for the quantitative results, we want to validate our hypothesis that if we take into uh, consideration the variability of blood flow throughout the brain, uh, the slices or the range of slices of an MRA, we could enhance our segmentation. And to do so, we have conducted two experiments. One is global and one is local. The global where we fit into the 3D CNN, the whole volume or the whole MRA uh, scan without any partitioning. And the second, or what we call a local, is to present as proposed in our framework the partitioned data. And uh, after doing so and completing the uh, results and, and, and getting the vessel tree <coughs> extracted, we have these uh, values. And as you can see, uh, the local experiments outperform the global in terms of dice similarity and sensitivity. 
And here are some of our FET qualitative results. To the left, you have the original slides, and to, uh, to the right, you have the local uh, uh, below circle of voice slides. And in the center, we have the global. The segmented uh, blood vessels are overlaid in red. I'm not sure if you, if you already see it in clear or not. And the enhanced, um, the enhanced uh, segmentation is contoured in green. For example, if you want to compare what we have in global and local, if we can say this, you will notice that we have more continuous uh, blood vessel than this. We have holes here in between, in the global. And locally, we have more continuous and also more points to be detected. Uh, here we don't have any points or voxels detected, and here we have some detected. The same also happens uh, in the local above uh, circle of Wallace. We have more continuous and more vessels uh, detected in the local uh, experiments than the global experiment. So in conclusion, we have uh, proposed a novel 3D CNN uh, based segmentation framework that takes into account the variability of the strength of blood flow, <coughs> signals and treble blood vessels over time. And uh, we, the local experiments we have proposed are performing the global one. And of course, this effective approach would have a good impact on any further analysis uh, or diagnosis uh, for hypertension. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, are you trying to, what's the smallest vessel you're trying to segment, and which ones are most important? Because if you're trying to look at which vessels you know, will give you information about hypertension or some of these other, other diseases, maybe do you think it's arterials that you need to, to segment most of the Yeah, first, we were able to delineate uh, blood vessels less than one millimeter, and these are very important for hypertension exactly because, as you know, as, as an effective hypertension, some of these uh, blood vessels um, disappear or something, so we, we need to focus on smaller blood vessels, and this was one of our challenges. Um, obviously, if you can segment each individual vessel, that's important, but uh, you're also interested in overall tissue perfusion, right? Because if the tissue perfusion changes, that would affect potentially hypertension. So, um, can you get some of the information that you need? just by looking at the overall perfusion in certain areas, or do you actually have to find the exact vessel information? Um, this is just a first step. The second step is we will take this uh, vascular tree and we'll extract some features such as the diameter size of these blood vessels, okay. the number of small size, the tissues of these blood vessels, and we will take this uh, information into consideration to uh, uh, when we want to, uh, you know, uh, detect hypertension or not. Is there a um, specific slice thickness, like a yeah. minimum slice thickness, where this this that's needed for this, um, or, or I should say maximum? Uh, if, if it's too, if the slice thickness is, is too large, does that make it more difficult to segment multiple slices together? What is that resolution? Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you remember the resolution? Yeah. I think it's I, I actually if we got like more thin, the more thin that we have, the, the, the more accurate the right. Sure. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if we have like a more thinner, uh, more thick, for example, it would affect the like mm -hmm. the 3D continuity yeah. of the blood vessels, and yeah. would be a, another challenge for us. But here for the little that we have, it's uh, thin uh, okay. resolution, and I think it's 0.7 millimeter something like that. Yeah. But, so but, I guess but, one yeah, question might be, uh, yeah, if. You know, if you're trying to do this in the future on other data sets, yeah. do you need special, you know, MR acquisitions that give you that, that yeah, resolution, or is that typical? Yeah. We have a protocol we have to follow. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Okay, so it looks like our next speaker will be...